Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 6th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three at any of those locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. In this, our first podcast of 2020, we focus on the top three issues we see for the year ahead. First, big picture, what the numbers tell us about where we are headed in the coming year, and more importantly, decade. Second, as the state pushes down costs, the munis are asking for a piece of the permanent fund earnings stream. Our reaction to that. And third, the governor takes an important step toward increasing the transparency of the BP Hill Corp transaction, likely the biggest oil story this coming year. And now, let's join Michael. You want to start off with a discussion from the Alaska Journal of Commerce, basically on, uh, you know, what is the 2020 forecast that time and savings basically have run out and there's no more road to kick this can down. And uh, so we should get started on that. Let's uh, let's see what you have to say on that. Well, I think as we've as we've now turned the page from uh, from the Christmas season, from the holiday season to uh, to January and people are starting to confront that the legislature is coming back and that we've got a budget that we're going to have to make for fiscal year 21. We're starting to see some fairly good articles uh, out of the press uh, about what the legislature, in fact, is confronting. There's a there's two in particular in the Alaska Journal of Commerce that I think are useful. One is Elwood Bremer's article that uh, uh, just has the title you just mentioned, 2020 forecast, time and savings have run out for the legislature. And then Andrew Jensen, the editor, uh, has an opinion piece uh, that's that's titled One Minute to Midnight, uh, referencing back to the old doomsday clock of the of the Cold War era. Uh, when uh, when scientists uh, would predict how close we were to to doomsday by uh, referencing a clock in the in the minutes left or the seconds left to to midnight, and, right. and Andrew's Andrew's title is uh, one minute to midnight, and I and I think those are appropriate when you look at the numbers um, in the ten year forecast, and 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 we need to concentrate we need to concentrate on the ten year forecast, not just what's in front of us next year, although that's important. But we need to look at, at the at the big picture. If, for example, we were going to run big deficits next year, but then you know the cavalry was coming over the hill, and and from there on out we were going to be okay. That's one thing. That's when you that's when you think about drawing savings. But but when you look at the ten year forecast, you see red uh, deficits as as far as the as far as the eye can see, and and it's appropriate to 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 to. You know, make these references to one minute to midnight, and uh, and time has run out. We're at the end of the road. Uh, when you look at the ten-year forecast, if you look at the governor's plan, um, if you just look at the basic numbers in the governor's plan of paying a full dividend, um, and even if you a lot of a lot of legislators are 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 quick now to talk about, well, I'm going to cap spending. Okay, ca- cap spending at at inflation. Okay, even if you cap spending at inflation, take the current level and and cap it at inflation, under the governor's plan, we run uh, billion-dollar deficits. In fact, uh, by the end of the period, by by 2030, uh, we're running a $2 billion deficit. Uh, We're running deficits as far as as the eye eye can see, even if you cap spending at, at inflation. And these deficits are huge. I mean, they're they average over the over the course of the ten years, around thirty five percent of spending. We're running thirty five percent of 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 the spending package 
is is deficit uh, over over that period. Uh, even if you um, assume going to POMV 5050, which Senator Shelley Hughes has talked about, which is the the resetting the PFD, restructuring the PFD to be to be 50% of the POMV draw, you're still talking about huge deficits again capping spending at inflation. The average deficit over using POMV 5050, the average deficit over the 10 year period is still over a billion dollars. It's about a, a billion, uh, 100 million, about a billion one. Uh, and that's still 23% uh, of spending, spending capped at inflation. So it, it's the, the, the issues that we're confronting this session, uh, now that we've run through savings, the issues we're confronting this session are are extremely uh, uh, large. I mean, we've kicked the can down the road. And we've put off uh, what would have been, had we started this in 2014, um, uh, fairly simple fixes. Uh, we've put them off and 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 drug our feet and relied on spending. Spending and as as Andrew says in his editorial, we're now one minute to midnight. Uh, and this session, even though it's an election year, really will set the tone. Uh, for for where we go from here, and and it needs to be a session where uh, where we look at the ten year plan and we look at where we're going uh, uh, down the road um, uh, as, as we try to come to some resolution of it. Well, we were just having this discussion, and I mean, and Harold uh, uh, Harold, I think, lost a bet. He said he thought he was paying, he was betting ten dollars that the word flat taxes would be used in the next 10 minutes and he, and he missed it. So, but I was commenting on the fact that, uh, you know, even, but even Ed King now is predicting, uh, I don't know if you saw his predictions over there, uh, that he had, he did a forecast for 2020 as well. Same kind of thing. He made eight predictions, but he says, uh, kind of like nothing's going to change on that front that we're just going to keep tapping into the dividend and we won't even have a tax by 2030 in 10 years. Do you think that's really the case? I mean, I don't, well, I don't even know at this point. Well, it's 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 not the case. I mean, the, to say we won't have a tax is not accurate. We've had a tax the last four years. I'm uh, sorry. I guess he says we won't have an income or a sales tax is what he says. Yeah, and 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 again, I would differ on that. The PFD the PFD cuts are an income tax. They're a tax. They're targeted. When you look at it the way an economist looks at it, they're a targeted tax on a specific type of income. It's an in, It's a it's a type of tax that has a hugely regressive effect takes the most from middle income and lower income Alaska families um, and and is and, and is a tax on their income on a portion of uh, on a on a portion of, of their income that that is significant to them um, what what Ed's really saying of course is that we won't have another broader based uh, income tax or a sales tax the kind that would affect uh, an income tax that would affect the top 20 percent uh, or a sales tax that would uh, have a have a broader effect, still regressive, but have a broader effect, and and that's a very <laughs> that's a very pessimistic forecast. That says the legislature will not do its job, that will that will continue to do a targeted income tax on on the PFD, continue to 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 ramp down uh, the PFD. The the governor's numbers show that under certain circumstances the PFD disappears before the end of the uh, before the end of the decade, uh, uh, just relying on it. Um, and, and it's very pessimistic. It says the legislators, legislators will continue to let the bulk of this burden uh, fall on middle and lower lower income Alaska families. And that's just, uh, it, yes, that that's a possibility, uh, but it's an abdication uh, of the of, of legislators' responsibility to look out for what's in the best interest of all Alaska families and the Alaska income. We have to remember that PFD taxes. Uh, according to the ICER 2016 study, PFD taxes have the largest adverse impact, not only on Alaska families, but also the overall Alaska income. So if or the Alaska economy. So if you are um, if, if you're a legislator that, that says, oh, I can, I'm concerned about the economy, I'm concerned about you know economic growth, I'm concerned about uh, uh, making sure that that the economy has the, the best foot forward that it possibly can. PF, the, the ICER study says PFD taxes are the worst way um, uh, to do that. So what, what, what that prediction is, Ed has some other predictions, um, but, but what that particular prediction is, is that legislators are going to fail in their job uh, and, 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 and they're not going to, 
to, to step forward and focus on what's in the best long-term interest of the over the overall Alaska economy and the best long-term interests uh, of, of Alaska families. Uh, I mean, he had some other predictions in here, and I don't know how deep you want to go into it. I thought it was kind of interesting because, again, it kind of holds up with your theme of what, uh, you know, what the 2020s will bring. Uh, he talks about... Uh, uh, you know the the permanent fund topping a hundred billion dollars. He talks about uh, uh, oil being over a hundred dollars per barrel. That Anwar won't be developed. I mean, there's a lot of different. Uh, he's, he's pulled a lot of different pieces in here. There's eight different predictions here. Yeah. Uh, so another one. Another one is it will be over seven hundred thousand barrels a day of production. So seven hundred thousand barrels a day at a hundred at a at hundred dollars a barrel. Um, when you make that prediction, it's easy to make the prediction that we won't have a tax by the end of the decade because we'll be back up to to, to revenue levels, oil revenue levels that uh, that sustain the state uh, through the through the early 20, uh, 20 teens from twenty uh, ten to about uh, uh, twenty fourteen. I, I predictions predictions are fun um, forecasts forecasts, which is what the OMB's done. Uh, and what the Department of Revenue done ha, have done is is what you use for budgeting. Predictions are sort of like parlor games, right? It's what it's what you have in your pocket when you go down to the bar uh, and have a discussion with friends, and everybody you know sort of says, "Well, you know, in, in one universe, uh, th- this might happen." I, I don't think I don't think even Ed intends those predictions to be to be used as the basis for um, any sort of uh, in, any sort of, of budgeting. Right. Uh, Long term that, planning. Right. Yeah. This is, again, more just like a this is a this is a, a tabletop discussion more than anything else. Yeah. And it's and it's fun. I mean, it, it's, it's thought provoking. It it it, uh, it it gets your mind sort of wrapped around different things. Is there a way we could get to one hundred dollars a barrel? Is there a way we could get to seven hundred thousand uh, barrels uh, of production? And it's and it's and it's sort of fun. As I say, it's a parlor game. It's sort of fun to to, to get your mind uh uh, going in uh, alternate sc- scenarios, it's it's sort of the it's sort of the economist version of uh, of 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 game playing, right? You know, it, instead of instead of sitting in front of your TV uh, playing games, you're sort of sitting there, th- you know, thinking out alternate universes uh, from an economic standpoint. But the real universe, the universe we live in, uh, the universe that uh, that 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 people who crunch numbers and and focus on these things. Um, uh, from the standpoint of putting together the forecast, is that we're running billion-dollar deficits uh, above uh, 20% of the budget uh, in deficit uh, from now until the end of the decade, and we don't have the savings uh, remaining to uh, uh, remaining to, uh, uh, to to deal with it. I, it, it to, a part of me says. And, and this probably is, is uh, this this is where Harold gets his ten dollars. A, a part of me says what I wish somebody would do is 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 throw out the tax. I mean that's part of what I've done to throw out and say we're going to pay for this through a tax and be real about it and 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 focus on it. And I think that changes the dynamic of the discussion. I think I think people then say, oh shit, I got to pay a tax or oh shoot, excuse me, <laughs> I've I've got to pay a tax. Um, uh, I'm going to get real about about these budget cuts as long as as long as a significant part of the of the population, probably the most significant part from a political standpoint, the top 20 percent, as long as they don't have to face up to the reality uh, of these deficits, as long as they're not the ones to that have to pay the bill, as long as they're able to slide it through PFD through using PFD taxes to middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, it, this is a, this isn't going to be real. They're not they're not going to treat it as real. They're gonna they're gonna treat it as a monopoly game. Um, the the moment that we concentrate on everybody and say everybody's going to have to pay a tax, everybody's going to have to have to confront the reality of these billion dollar deficits. Um, I think I think the dynamics change, and I think people get real about about finding cost savings. Um, and that's. Uh, my hope for this legislative session is that is that legislators do understand, um, and 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 the governor understands the gravity of the situation we're facing. That we are, in fact, as Andrew says, Andrew Jensen says in his editorial, uh, a minute from midnight, um, and that and that we take that, and that and that we then say, okay, we've got to do something about this because if we don't do something about it, everybody 
is going to is going to suffer the consequences. Everybody's going to have uh, skin in the game, and and that process I think moves us closer to a resolution uh, than certainly we've been the last few years, where they've just sloughed the the problem off first on future Alaskans by taking from savings. Um, and then on middle and lower income Alaska families by using PFD cuts. But, you know, Brad, as we look at these predictions, though, I mean, I think uh, both the Elwood Bremer and the um, uh, and the King piece are interesting, uh, at least as a thought as a thought experiment to take a look at how these things will develop. I mean, the Anwar, the global recession, one of the most interesting things that I think that King talked about was the fact that he thinks that somebody in the next uh, four to eight years is going to re-sign us to the Paris Accords, and that's going to change things uh, how we do, uh, you know, how we do things uh, in this country with en- with the energy sector, and the fact that the uh, that all these kids today who are the woke generation are all going to become politicians, and we're going to be looking at a whole new, you know, uh, decade of uh, of weirdness when it comes to the political scene. Yeah, so the $100 prediction, I mean, how he gets the $100 prediction is interesting. He essentially says, we're going to elect a president that's going to ban frac- fracking, um, at, which will shut down <coughs> the shale revolution or the shale oil in the lower 48, will turn uh, uh, control of the oil markets back over to the Middle East, uh, and and that OPEC will then have enough power to, to drive uh, oil prices um, uh, back up again. Uh, and 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 while uh, and and while uh, we will enjoy that hundred dollar oil, really the implication of that, because if they're going to ban fracking, they're going to ban uh, whatever administration is doing that is going to ban Arctic development as well. Uh, the implication of that is we'll have one last hurrah uh, of of where we have this hundred dollar oil, uh, but we won't be able to develop any more. So we'll sort of ride ride off into the sunset. Uh, with high oil prices and with a high starting point for for decline after that, but it it won't last very long. Um, so it's it's yeah it's a it's an interesting interesting set of of thought dynamics. As I say, it's a parlor game. I mean these these sorts of predictions are parlor games um, and and sort of designed to get your mind going and 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 think about things in a in an alternate way. Um, but but even that, even the hundred dollar oil scenario, the way you get to the hundred dollar oil scenario, that paints a par- fairly bleak picture once you get into the twenty thirties and twenty twenty forties, because it assumes that that we have a, a federal administration that's closed down virtually all oil development. Um, I, I it, it's I, I we can't spend we we can spend time on that. It's fun to do it. Fun to go to a bar and do it. Uh, but you you can't let that drive your thinking about what Alaska faces um, in the next decade. Yes, OMB has been wrong. They've not been wrong by that much, frankly, uh, uh, in uh, since about 2014. Uh, they designed a new system. They did a new system on, on oil uh, uh, production at that point, uh, and it's been much more reliable. Prices have been difficult, but prices have been difficult for everybody. But it's sort of the best you got. Um, and, and for us to sort of dismiss uh, what o- the OMB forecast and say, oh, they've been wrong in the past, they'll be wrong in the future, like, no reason to pay attention to it. Uh, for us to dismiss that is just, is just foolishness uh, because we have no savings, we have no, we have no savings to fall back on. We're essentially saying, yeah, we're going to plunge off into this, into this canyon uh, without a parachute um, uh, because we, we believe there are a bunch of foam mattresses down at the bottom. Um, <laughs> And and it's not and and there aren't. Uh, I'm, and, sorry, I'm just laughing at the, at the 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 imagery of that. You know, hey, just swan dive right here. Don't worry, the mattresses will get. Oh my God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what that's sort of what we've been doing, Michael. I've right. been. I mean, if you look at the 20 teens, we've been sort of doing that. We've been saying, oh, there, you know, there's mattresses at the bottom, and if not, we've got this 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 parachute in savings. Yeah. That will that will suddenly show up along the way, and 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 we've. Used Use that parachute every time. Well, the parachute's gone. Right. Uh, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. That's all I'm <laughs> saying. You know. Well, that and that's and that's the problem. You can only do it so many times before, uh, you know, before you just you run the well dry, and that's where we're at. And and it's like nobody is willing to look at this and say, 
uh, here's what the actual problem is. Uh, you're you're now done. There's no more monies in this. You know, have a nice day. So there isn't, and we've got to confront that. I mean, I, I, you and I have been saying that since 2010, 2012. But but we've got to confront that. Yeah. Right, continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, the weekly top three. We're into number two, which is everybody wants some of that action. The municipalities, the Alaska Municipal League and uh, Mayor Ethan Berkowitz now are greedily eyeing the biggest piece of pie around, and that, of course, is the permanent fund. He has proposed that maybe, just maybe, the municipality should get a piece of that pie, that instead of uh, the POMV being a 50-50 split, maybe it should be 45-45, and 45, and then the cities get 10% of that split to be able to do with it what they want. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a kind of a dangerous road. I mean, it's got a kind of a cool reception, but it's, uh, this idea has been around for a few years, Brad. Yeah, it's an old Hickel idea. Uh, Governor Hickel uh, advocated a community dividend um, uh, back uh, back in his uh, his his days when he was when he was active, and the community dividend would be to take a portion of the PFD that otherwise goes to citizens, uh, and to give it to the community as a whole, local community as a whole, uh, for the local community to use. It's an idea that's been picked up by uh, the Alaska Municipal League. Um, there's a there's a, a a good reason for that. Uh, Nils Andreasen, who I who I count as a as a very good friend, somebody I I respect and admire, uh, was the executive director of of uh, the Institute of the North, uh, which was a Wally Hickel uh, foundation uh, devoted to, to Hickel's principles, pushing Hickel's principles. One of those was the community di- dividend. Nils has now moved over to be the executive director of the Alaska Municipal League. Uh, and and surprise surprise the community dividend has shown up as an idea uh, <laughs> over in the Alaska Municipal League and, and I it's a I mean it's an it's a legitimate idea that Governor Hickel had and, and Governor Hickel um, uh, has has pushed here here's here's my point of, of listing that issue as, as number two though I think the sleeper issue this year uh, down the legislature is going to be municipalities. Um, and the reason the reason for that is is sort of this: the municipalities, uh, Anchorage in particular, are sort of saying that they're hitting the fiscal wall also. Right. And if you if you follow the news, you know that there are a series of three town halls uh, that are coming up in municip- municipality starting tonight. The first one's in Anchorage tonight, mm-hmm. and then there's one in Chugiak, and then there's one uh, uh, down in Girdwood uh, over the next over the next two days. And those town halls are to discuss tax proposals uh, that that the municip- that the that the uh, municipal uh, assembly is considering putting on uh, on the ballot uh, this coming year. One of the tax proposals is to institute a sales tax, um, and then other proposals are to increase the tax on uh, alcohol, increase the sin taxes generally. Um, and and the municipality is saying they need to do that because because st- more burdens are being pushed on the municipality from the state, um, uh, uh, bond uh, school bond uh, being one of those, school bond reimbursement being one of those, um, and and their revenue sources the, the city's revenue sources are municipality's revenue sources are tapped out they can't they can't handle in addition to everything else they're doing they can't handle the additional. A burden that's coming down from the state, and so they're starting these town halls to talk about about raising revenues. I, my my guess is, um, especially given Ethan's desire to be governor someday, my guess is that they sort of that they start converting that into a discussion about pushing back on the state, saying, "Look, state, if you're going to push these burdens down on us, you need to give us a share of your revenue, also, or else." We're going to have to raise revenue on. We're going to have to raise taxes on, on uh, uh, Anchorage citizens uh, and other municipalities would do the same. Um, and that's and that's a horrible thing. And try to motivate the Anchorage citizenry, the anger that the Anchorage citizenry otherwise might have against the assembly for proposing to raise taxes. Try to try to manipulate and turn that toward the the state. Right. Uh, by saying the real problem is the state, the state ought to be giving us the state ought to be giving us these funds. So even though this uh, this proposal, this community dividend proposal, got a cool reception from legislators at the beginning, I don't think we've heard the end of it. 
Um, and I think we uh, we continue to hear uh, we hear more about it, uh, particularly in Anchorage, but we continue to hear more about it uh, as this session goes on. I, I would say this is not just an Anchorage issue. One of the one of the topics that KTUU at least picked up uh, from the uh, Matsu uh, de uh, legislative delegation discussion uh, last week uh, was uh, a discussion by somebody about school bond reimbursement that that uh, uh, one of the speakers was pressing the legislators uh, uh, not to uh, limit the states or not to reduce the state's uh, 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 school bond reimbursement that the concern was that was pushing too much cost down on the valley was impacting the school district and, and, and things like that. So I, I think this pushback comes comes from a number of municipalities across the state. Well, you know, and I and I and I'm sure it does as well because they're all in full on panic mode because they've had the gravy train is now drying up. That's the problem. And I, again, having served on the borough assembly, I can tell you that I've had this conversation with one of the mayor's chiefs of staff where he's like, "Well, why wouldn't you vote for it? It's free money." And I'm like, "It's not free." First of all, uh, I mean, this is we're talking this was probably close to 10 years ago now uh, because it was one of my first years in the in the uh, in the assembly. And uh, and I'm said it's not free. You know, well, the, you know, the state pays for it. And I was like, if the citizens want it, they will pay for it. And I said, we shouldn't just be looking to this, quote unquote, free money that's going on. And that's part of the problem. People are you know, it's always OPM. And whether it's the municipalities, whether it's the state or whatever, it's always somebody else's money that, you know, all these programs are a great idea when it's somebody else's money. The citizenry is going to have to, I mean, I hope they get mad. I hope they get upset about it and they're like, well, you know, if we really want that program, well, then you'll pay for it, Jack. You know, all these free schools that everybody was talking about and these bond issues. Oh, don't worry about it. The state will pay for it. It'll be fine. You are indebting your own property for that. You are on the hook, whether the state pays for it or not. And now everybody's getting a taste of that. And we've been talking about this for years. This is a dose of reality. It is. I, 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 I always chuckle a little bit uh, when I hear Matt Sue talk about school bond reimbursement. Uh, the reason is Governor Dunleavy was on the school board at the time. Right. That, that, that some, of the, some of that school uh, uh, construction took place, and he voted for uh, uh, those, uh, those, those bond or voted for that construction. And one of the reasons he did is because the state was going to pay for it. Right. Um, so it's sort of, yeah, I mean, these things come back, come back. Uh, you're exactly right. It's not free money. Uh, somebody has to pay for it. These things come back uh, to bite you and they're coming back now to bite, uh, munis the municipalities. And I, and, and as I say, the municipalities are going to push back, I think, um, uh, trying to mobilize their citizenry. To, by saying you're going to have to pay for it if the state doesn't uh, and try to mobilize their citizenry to, to push the state uh, it, in some fashion to uh, to fund it. The community, uh, the community dividend, as I say, has has at least the 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 the, the imprimatur of Governor Hickel. Uh, so people can talk about it being Hickel's uh, idea in the same way that the people talk about uh uh, the PFD being Governor Hammond's idea that right. people can say, well, this is Hickel's idea, and and we're just trying to to implement it. I think I think I think it's an issue we're going to continue to hear uh, through the legislative session. I think the the sort of the municipality strike back uh, is a theme that's going to that's going to be uh, consistent through the through the session, and, and I think it's a sleeper <laughs> issue in terms of how it plays out. Well, we'll be watching that closely. The third and final issue for today uh, is going to be uh, this discussion of the Hill Court BP sale and the fact that uh, Governor Dunleavy has now put a panel together to kind of oversee this. I think it's a great – I think uh, putting the panel together is a great thing. I think the BP Hill Corp sale is going to come to a head during the first half of this year. They want to close close the transaction in the second quarter uh, by the end of June, and I think the state's going to have to confront it. State's sort of been slow, frankly, in responding to it. Uh, it's taken it a little bit to, to to get underway. I think this uh, the oversight committee that that uh, that Governor Dunleavy's created, which is really a coordination group among various uh, state bodies that are responsible for looking at various pieces of the transaction, uh, is a, is a good step. There needs to be a lot of public discussion. About the consequences of the of the of the sale. Not, I, I mean, I I I think the sale's a reality. I think we've got to recognize it's a reality. 
but so that Alaskans understand the sale. The, the last thing we, I, I think the last thing the governor should want, and frankly, the last thing that Hillcorp should want is is for this uh, for this sale to sort of go on quietly. And then all of a sudden in July, we wake up and we see that we're going to have a 500 uh, 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 person job loss um, uh, as a result of the transaction. I mean, Hillcorp's going to grow, but BP is going to go away. Um, and the net of that is 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 that we're going to be down 500 jobs. I, I think I think people need to know about that earlier rather than later, earlier in the process, so they can I- articulate their concerns about it, and and the governor and and the government can put whatever sideboards on it they want to put on it, uh, and do that in a public way as opposed to in a in sort of a, a smoke filled rooms way that that then will lead to a lot of complaining. Uh, and criticism later on, and I and I think the panel uh, putting together this oversight committee is is a good step in that process, a public a public step um, uh, that uh, that will bring information together and, and bring people together talking about it publicly uh, in a way that uh, that the transaction should be. It's a big transaction. We need to understand it. Alaskans need to understand it. Uh, uh, as it comes together, as opposed to you know, complaining about it later on. Final thoughts, Brad. Here, as we uh, let you go on this, I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think it's interesting to see, um, you know, how much uh, uh, this is going to affect Alaska and how this oversight committee really kind of is going to, uh, you know, kind of keep it down in the, you know, keep it, uh, I guess, in the public eye. I guess, kind of update the folks on what's going on. Uh, because, like you said, nobody wants to know that all of a sudden there's going to be five or six or seven hundred jobs lost, uh, and have that just come out of the blue. Well, I, I go back to the to the Tony Knowles uh, administration's handling of the BP Arco merger, and there were there were some things that could have been done better, but in but in all honesty, I think Governor Knowles and his team at the time handled that very well. They held hearings, public hearings, uh, on uh, on what their decisions were. Uh, uh, with respect to uh, the things, the sideboards they were going to put on the transactions, the the approvals they were giving to the transactions, they allowed for public discussion. They they put a lot of information out in the public about what the consequences of the of the merger would be and the steps they were taking, the steps the government was taking to respond to it. And I think in 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 in, in all, all all taken together, I think that was a very good handling of a of a major transaction um, uh, affecting the state. Um, and 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 there were complaints afterwards, but there were there 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 were relatively few, um, and 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 they were easily responded to by saying, "Well, look, we knew this at, at the time of the transaction. It's not a it's not a big surprise. Nobody, there wasn't a great conspiracy theory to cover this up." Um, and I and I think that's what we need to do with B, BP Hillcorp. It needs to be a very open, uh, uh, transparent discussion. I don't think anybody's talking about trying to kill the transaction. Uh, uh, I think people are just trying to understand it and understand the consequences. And I think it's in the governor's interest um, uh, and and in Hillcorp's interest as well for for a very fulsome discussion to go on. Um, then for the transaction to be approved with whatever whatever sideboards on it or on it. Uh, that are negotiated with the company, um, and then and then to go forward uh, uh, from that point forward, doing it in the in a smoke filled room and in, in the back someplace, uh, and then letting the transaction occur, and then all of a sudden you know we wake up and oh my gosh, Hill Corp doesn't pay taxes, we've lost 500 people from the from the oil workforce as a result of the merger, uh, and 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 things like and things like that. Uh, I think are going to would work to the governor's disadvantage. People would say that you know the governor capitulated to a corporation in the in the dark of night, uh, um, and and needs to be criticized for that. So I, it's a good step to put this together. I think the next step uh, is for is for them to continue to work on on the issues that that arise in the transaction, and then have a public discussion of those issues and what the administration is doing to meet them. All right. Well, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and joining us this morning. As always, it's uh, fun to speak with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.